Sounds good. No. No. Uh oh. Working. <laughs> okay. I'll just speak. I, I can certainly project. I just don't know what what uh, volume is best for me. Is that good? Can everyone hear? Okay. Thumbs up in the back. Excellent. All right. Well, it is an absolute pleasure to be here and to be part of the revival of the, uh, the venerable Saturday morning uh, science series. So it's, it's a real honor to be the first one to talk about this. How many people here have heard of the James Webb Space Telescope or JWST? Okay. So everyone, right? It, it is NASA's you know, biggest, newest space observatory. Um, it is our our observatory, right? It, it's, it's basically put into space for our combined benefit, right? And what I'm going to talk to you today is about observing uh, with the James Webb Space Telescope. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the telescope, how it works, why it's important, and then tell you about the science it's doing, highlighting some of the, the work that's being done here at Toledo. So that's part of the Toledo Odyssey, but there's another part that I'll get into in a moment. Now, the James Webb Space Telescope works primarily in the infrared. It uses infrared light to study um, the universe, right? So maybe all of us, so the infrared light is just another form of light, like visible light, like the light that we all see with our eyes. But obviously you can't see infrared light with our eyes. We're not sensitive to it. But we can see it with a camera, like the infrared camera shown over here, right? And so this is actually, you might recognize it, it's a camera that's often used in home energy audits. And you can now see that all of us are glowing in the infrared. If I turned off the lights, which we won't do for safety reasons, we would all still be glowing in the infrared. That picture would look pretty much the same. And that's because we all emit. Anybody who's warm, who's room temperature, who's human temperature, is going to emit infrared light. right? And so we all glow in infrared light. Okay. And if you want to come down, there might be a little bit of time afterwards and, and you know, see what you look like in the camera, uh, please do that. And we'll, we'll come back to that. Now, the, the James Webb is an infrared telescope, and so you might recognize, does anyone recognize these, uh, these pillars of creation from the Hubble Space Telescope? Right? Right? That's what they look like. Notice that they're dark. These are basically massive clouds of gas and dust, and the dust makes them very dark at visible light. 
But when we basically, when we look in the infrared, it suddenly becomes, they, they suddenly glow. There's dust grains emitting light, just like we're all emitting light, but infrared light. And the James Webb Space Telescope can map these. Also see the infrared light from stars. Also see infrared light from many other things emitting uh, throughout the universe. And so you can think of the James Webb Space Telescope as the ultimate sort of home audit device, camera, um, except it's auditing the energy from the entire universe. Now, almost everything we know about the external universe beyond our own solar system comes through light, right? So astronomers, we spend most of our time studying light in all of its different forms. And so this is an image uh, that I was part of, of the Orion Nebula made by combining data from the Hubble and the Spitzer Space Telescopes. And you can see there's a multitude of colors in this. And these colors all tell us about things that are happening in these distant regions, their properties and such, right? And so to become an astronomer, you have to become sort of an expert in light. So I'm going to give you a very brief introduction, and please ask questions afterwards. Um, I, I'd love to discuss and explain this more. But the light that we see is just a small portion of something called the electromagnetic spectrum, right? And it extends quite a distance. You can see, if you read this plot here, there are things from basically gamma rays on the right to radio waves, right? We're all familiar with gamma rays. We're, we've all had an X-ray. We all turn on the radio. These are all carried by the same electromagnetic radiation. It's all just versions of light. And the only difference between it is light is a wave, and we characterize the waves by how far apart the crests are, right? And so if the crests are tiny, very close together, you have gamma rays. If they're very spread apart, you have radio waves. And visible light is in between, right? And the things that emit these different types of light um, have basically our um, are, uh, trace different kinds of temperatures, right? So if you want something that emits in x-rays, you need a gas that's millions of degrees in temperature. If you want to have something that's visible light, it's got to be thousands of degrees or something. Infrared, maybe uh, like uh, 10 degrees or hundreds of degrees. And in radio, we can actually detect things that are very cold, among other things. Right? Now, in, this, in, the, in the universe, there are things of many different temperatures. Right? There are really hot gas from supernova that's million degrees kelvins, and there are cold clouds of gas and dust, like I just showed you, where, where the temperature is just like 10 degrees above absolute zero, zero. So you want to go from million degree objects to 10 degree objects, right? from absolute zero almost to things that have unimaginable temperatures. And so to do this, to study this, we as astronomers need the entire electromagnetic spectrum. Right? We want to observe everything from space, from gamma, ray, gamma rays to radio waves. Right? Now, there's a problem with some of this. Right? So this is an, uh, a picture of an astronomer uh, in visible light and the infrared. And notice the astronomer has a plate of plexiglass, just like the one I have up here. And you can do this experiment afterwards. And as you, as you can see, in visible light, we can see right through the plexiglass. But in infrared light, the plexiglass stops it. It's opaque. So there are some things that visible light can go through that are transparent, but are opaque to other forms of light, like infrared light. And one of those things is the Earth's atmosphere. Now, this is a little bit more complicated plot from NASA, but it's sort of showing where we can look through the Earth's atmosphere and where we cannot. And so if you look at the top, you'll see a whole range of the electromagnetic spectrum from gamma rays to radio waves, right? Sort of in reverse direction of the last one. And you look at this, this numbers here, where the line is up here, that means the atmosphere is 100% opaque, right? So gamma rays cannot come through the atmosphere. X-rays cannot come through the atmosphere. Fortunately, visible light travels through the atmosphere very readily. Our eyes are tuned to that. The infrared, things start getting a little bit sketchy and basically become opaque. And it's not into the radio waves that the atmosphere becomes transparent again. So the problem is, is we can't, as astronomers, point a telescope upward to look at x-rays or most of the infrared because the atmosphere is opaque to that. So this is where the first Toledo connection comes in, because it was basically a person born in Toledo, Ohio, named Lyman Spitzer. Right? There's a Spitzer family that had a Spitzer building uh, downtown. Some of you may remember it's the same family. And he was born in uh, Toledo 1914, and then went off to become one of the premier sort of theoretical astrophysicists. 
Now, in the 1940s, look, this is written in 1946, so this is before the space age started, really. He wrote a report to the Rand Corporation extolling the advantages of putting telescopes above the atmosphere. He said, you put a telescope above the atmosphere because people were starting to imagine that you have rockets that can launch satellites into space. And you, with, these, with a telescope in space, A, you get out of the turbulence of the atmosphere so things are not as fuzzy, but B, you can see all the wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum from gamma rays all the way through infrared and radio waves. Now, he was a theorist, so he didn't build instruments, but he was very instrumental in building the Hubble Space Telescope. And a lot of that was actually because, in addition to being a theoretical astrophysicist, he was actually really good at lobbying Congress. He, had, he, was, um, he was very plain spoken from what I've heard. He was honest, he was direct, and, and people in Congress appreciated this. And eventually, they appropriated money to build the Hubble Space Telescope. And not only that, but a fleet of great observatories. This is actually from a brochure that was distributed to Congress, right? So this is, this is how you, you uh, encourage it. And there's actually three different satellites on there with their acronyms. They've all been renamed, except for HST. This is the Hubble Space Telescope. There's an X-ray telescope. There's an infrared telescope. And the point is, is each one of them sees the part of the infrared spectrum. But if we put them together, we get a discovery, right? And so a lot of what astronomers do is we put together observations made with different kinds of light to make discoveries about how the universe works. Now, he was, the Hubble Space Telescope was launched, and now this is uh, images, data that we have taken here at the University of Toledo of uh, a protostar, a young star, and I'll speak more of those, in the Hubble Space Telescope. And um, you'll just see there's a little protostar there. This is actually created by, by uh, jets coming out of the protostar. And this is taken just touching into the infrared about two and a half times the wavelength of red light. The problem with the Hubble Space Telescope is that there's a protostar in here as well, but the dust is so opaque we can't actually see it. Right? It's launching jets at hundreds of kilometers per second in both directions, but there's basically this blank area right here. And so we needed a new telescope. And before the James Webb Space Telescope was launched, there was a Spitzer Space Telescope, which is seen in this animation. Uh, and it's a much smaller telescope, but it could see in the infrared. It was the first, basically, infrared observatory, well, second, actually, in space, the most powerful of its time. And I, I actually was part of the team that helped build one of the instruments. I was there for the launch of it. And it functioned for about 15 years flawlessly, and we've taken an enormous amount of data with it. And you notice the name Spitzer Space Telescope. It was named so unfortunately, Lyman Spitzer passed away before the telescope was launched, and so they named the telescope in, in, in Spitzer's honor. That's why it's called the Spitzer Space Telescope. Right. Now, what can you do in the infrared? Well, I don't know how many people have seen the constellation of Orion. Right? You can actually see it from Toledo. OK, a few. You. you should look up at it. It's beautiful. And there's a sword of Orion. And if you had like a, a, an amateur, a very expensive amateur camera, and you took a really deep exposure of the sword of Orion, you would see this with the Orion Nebula in the middle, which maybe some of you have seen uh, through a telescope. Right? And this is what it would look like in visible light. This is what it looks like in infrared. Uh, with wavelengths five to 250 times that of red light. Right? This is an image made by Robert Hurt combining data from the Spitzer Space Telescope and a, and a European observatory called the Herschel Space Observatory. And suddenly you see a very different view. And in fact, this red stuff here doesn't look like much, but it's about 3,000 times the mass of the sun in a giant filament of gas and dust where, where, where thousands of stars are actually forming. Right? So now we can actually really start studying the formation of stars stars. Now, here's another reason why you want to go into the infrared. This is a region where stars are forming in a cloud of gas and dust, taken with a very large telescope from the ground at visible wavelengths. And you can see there's stuff going on there. There's little light poking through the fog. But most of it's dark. You can't see through that. And that's because all the dust is absorbing the visible light. But you take the Spitzer Space Telescope, and you point it at this, and suddenly you see this cluster of over 100 stars and protostars, all of them less than a million years old. That may not sound, that sounds like a long time, but for a star, a million years is nothing, right? So um, these are all young stars forming. And so this is the power of the infrared. 
Now, if you can compare all of these different telescopes, um, here, just by their size, here is the Spitzer Space Telescope, the Hubble, and the James Webb Space Telescope in comparison, right? Now, what, the part of the telescope that's most important is the mirror. Telescopes work, modern telescopes, not through lenses, but by having mirrors that basically collect and focus the light, whether it's infrared light or visible light or even radio waves. They collect that light and then they focus it down. And the bigger the mirror, the more light you can collect, and also the sharper the images you get. Now, the Hubble Space Telescope, which was the first one of these launched, had a mirror of about 2.4 meters, right? So it's basically about, you know, a little bit bigger than a person. Right, and the telescope was actually quite large. The Spencer Space Telescope, the mirror was only 85 centimeters, right? I mean, I actually worked on this thing, and when you actually, you know, spent, saw, you spent years working on it, and you actually saw the telescope in the clean room, you was like, wow, that's it? It's like smaller than the, uh, the telescope on top of Ritter. But because it was in cold space above the atmosphere, it was far more powerful in the infrared than any other telescope of its day, right? But now Spitzer is, is done, and now we're moving on to a larger telescope, and that's where the James Webb Space Telescope comes. It has a mirror that's basically 6.6 .6 meters in diameter, right? It's like about 20 feet, right, in space. And you can sort of see how the telescope looks a lot different. We think of telescopes as a tube with a mirror in it. This is a whole different kind of construction, because NASA had to go to a completely different type of architecture to put a telescope this large into space. Right, so just to give you an advantage, a, a, a picture, a clear picture of the advantage of James Webb over Spitzer, here we have images of the same region of the sky in the infrared with Spitzer on the left and James Webb Space Telescope on the right, right. And so you can see the same stars are visible. There's one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and so on. But with the JWST, the image is much, much sharper. And not only that, you can look at regions where you can sort of see there's a few stars poking through the Spitzer data, but now there's many more stars in the JWST data. So it has the ability to look at, make much, much sharper images, right, more clarity, and it has the ability to make much more sensitive images, right? So we can see things that Spitzer, unfortunately, was not able to detect, right? So this is the last picture ever taken of the JWST when it was, it was launched by a European rocket called the Ariane 5, and, and perfectly, it was like the most perfect launch the astronomers could have dreamed of, uh, on Christmas Day in 2021. It was sort of an accident that it happened on Christmas, but that's the day that basically the window opened up. James Webb has no cameras on it, so it can't take pictures of itself, but the Ariane had a picture camera on it, a little webcam, and this is a parting shot. It is now basically about a million miles away, right? On the, uh, the further than the moon, right? Observing. Now, when you look at this, it's all packed up. It doesn't look anything like the telescope that I just showed you, right? And so after it was launched, this telescope had to go through a frighten frighteningly com complicated, excuse me, <laughs> very difficult and complicated unfurling, which Every astronomer on Earth was terrified as this happened because if anything failed, the telescope could be useless. Right? And so here's an animation showing what happens just after launch. Basically, some solar panels come out. This is sort of sped up a bit. And one of the important components is a sun shield. Right? You have to protect the telescope from all the light from the sun and the heat from the sun as well. And so all of these very thin sort of mylar-like shields were extended. And this is about the size of, a, it's bigger than a school bus basically across here. Right? I'm gonna do this one more time. And so you can sort of see that the sun shields unfurled, right? And then the telescope pops out. And the telescope itself, 6.6 .6 meters, is too big to put into a fairing of a, of a spacecraft, even a large rocket, right? And so you can see it's all folded up, and then the secondary mirror pops out, and then all this, basically the other two parts fold out. And now you have a 6.6 .6 meter mirror. And then it was aligned to precision, right? Because each, this mirror is made out of a whole bunch of different panels, you can see them, they're all hexagonal, and they all have to be perfectly aligned. And then once they are perfectly aligned, they basically reflect light, I don't have an animation to show this, but you can follow my, my wobbly laser pointer, and they hit the panel here, they focus on this point, and then they're basically, this mirror reflects them through this opening here and into instruments on the back 
which basically um, then analyze the infrared light. And then all of that information, you can't see that, but there's an antenna on the bottom of this, and that antenna basically sends all the data down to Earth, and then it uploads a whole bunch of instructions. Right? So there's nobody with a joystick at NASA controlling this. Everything is basically planned in advance. The instructions are sent to the space, to the telescope every, every day or so, and it does all of the observations robotically. And then when it's finished, it sends all the data back home. And we, as astronomers here in Toledo, we can just basically download it onto our laptops. Right? So that's how it works. Okay. Now let me get into some of the science uh, that we can do with the, the James Webb Space Telescope. Right? So um, imagine you're just looking up into the night sky. It's not the night sky from Toledo, but this is what you might see if you go up to the Upper Peninsula. Right? It's filled with stars. Right? And if you're lucky, you can actually see the Milky Way and such. Right? And so when we look up into the night sky, we see all these stars. But what are these stars in the first place? And where did they come from? So let me give you a very quick lesson on stars that I have to do, so this makes sense. But basically, stars are made out of hydrogen and helium, mostly. Mostly hydrogen, right? They are massive objects of basically hot gas, and they radiate because they're hot, right? Uh, it's as simple as that. They are in an equilibrium. Because the gas is hot, there's a pressure that pushes outward, and they have a, they're very massive. Our sun is, of course, a star. And so the gravity pulls them together. Right? So you have this competition between pressure and gravity. And through most of their lives, they are sort of in a perfect equilibrium. And during most of their lives, although not all of their lives, they're powered by nuclear reactions in the cores of the stars. Right. Now you can see different stars. These are all stars that are visible in the night sky if you knew where to look. Well, one of them isn't. Right? There's uh, a Spica, which is a very massive star, about 11 times the mass of our sun. There's Sirius, uh, which is about two times the mass of our sun. There's the sun. And then there's Proxima Centauri, which actually is the closest star to our sun, but is most, most, it's so small and faint that you can't actually see it with the naked eye. Right? And you can see that the masses go from 11 to about a tenth of the mass of the sun, right? So there's a range of masses of stars that goes from about 0.1 to, uh, to 10, a factor of 100, right? The mass of a star basically determines its entire life, right? It determines whether, if it's a very massive star, it'll have a fairly short life for a star, you know, 10 million years, and then undergo a supernova and explode and put all of its material back into space. If it's an intermediate mass star, uh, like, like Sirius, it might last a billion years. Our sun is about halfway through its, its 10 billion year lifespan before it runs out of nuclear, uh, runs out of hydrogen in its core. And Proxima Centauri will last for a long, long time. And most stars actually are less massive than our sun. Like most stars are down here in mass. The stars are also responsible uh, for all of the atoms heavier than hydrogen and helium in our body. The carbon in our body, the oxygen in our body, nitrogen, all of that is made in stars, and they're made in the cores of stars. Now, if you look at these lifetimes, all of these lifetimes are less than the age of the universe. So over the universe, there's been many, many generations of stars. And those elements are built in stars and then released when the stars die through various ways, right, through explosions and stuff. And so then that material is recycled into the next generation of stars. And some of that material makes, it way, it makes its way into planets. And so we are basically material, mostly made out of material that was formed in stars. So stars are really important, obviously, for the evolution of the universe. The masses of stars are very important, and how fast they form is important. All right, so let's go back to our starry sky. Where did these, all these stars come from? Right? So let's go back basically to the beginning. 13.7 billion years ago, the universe was hydrogen and helium. And something called dark matter, which I'm not going to talk about. Right? It's most of it, but it doesn't really do much. Well, it does, yeah, I'm not going to go that direction. Anyway, this is the afterglow left about 370,000 years after the, the Big Bang. It happened when all the atoms of hydrogen and helium were sort of coming together. Um, and this is a map made by a European space observatory called Planck. And it's actually the entire sky. You know how you take a globe and they sort of make it the whole Earth into like an oblong image? This is like if you did the same thing with the sky. So it's the entire sky. And the, the emission is actually really uniform. 
But to make this picture, they, they up the contrast. And so you can see that it's not perfectly uniform. There's little specks in there. And those are little specks are little, tiny little concentrations. Well, they're actually massive concentrations of mass. But it's just a little where the, the, the matter is a little bit more dense. And those eventually will form the galaxies. And then the galaxies, the stars. So our current picture of the evolution of the universe right now is this, that about 13.7 billion years ago, you had the Big Bang. And about 370,000 years after that, you had a universe of hydrogen and helium and dark matter. And it wasn't really doing much. There were no stars to light up the universe, right? Um, but at that point, gravity from the star, from the gas, and from the dark matter was starting to organize all this matter into what we call the giant cosmic web. And that is a lecture all in itself, right? And then in parts of this, matter started collecting and forming galaxies. And in those galaxies, stars started forming. And that happens probably about 400 million years after the Big Bang was when the galaxies and stars start forming. And then this process continues on to this day, stars continually forming and recycling material and building up the abundances of the elements, uh, all the elements that are in our own body, right? And so our sun formed somewhere in a million, 4.6 billion years ago, somewhere in the middle there, right? And the universe, while this is happening, continues to expand outward, right? There's the expansion of the universe, which hopefully most of you have heard about, but space is literally expanding. Now, the beauty of the JWST is that it can act in, in, in two ways I'll talk about as a time machine. One is that it can look at very distant objects, and the speed of light is finite. So if you look at something that's very, very far away, um, that light has taken a long time to get here. And so you're looking at that object not as it appears today, but millions or even billions of years ago. Right? Um, so this is a picture the JWST telescope made of basically what would appear to most people as a blank area of sky. But if you take a really deep exposure, you'll see this. There's all of these galaxies here. Almost every light you see is a galaxy, right? And some of these galaxies are fairly nearby by galaxy standards. Um, but some of these things are incredibly distant. You'll see things that are faint and are, faint, are red, right? And these, when you see something like that, you are looking back in time because anything that you see that's faint and red, and I'll show you some examples in a moment, are things where the light has been traveling towards us for billions of years. And so we see them as they appeared billions of years ago. Now, one of the advantages of using an infrared telescope is that as the universe expands, it stretches the light. Right? So if you have starlight emitted by a galaxy you know, 13 billion years ago, as it travels towards the Earth, it's going to be stretched out. And it's going to be stretched into visible light, so the light that our sun makes abundantly to infrared light. And so if you want to observe these distant galaxies, you want to go into the infrared and build an infrared telescope like the James, James Webb. And this is one of the primary reasons it was built. There's also a, a, a second... Um, the second thing here is that, um, as I showed before, there's lots of dust in space, and the infrared light is good at penetrating that dust. And that's also important, not just when looking at young stars, but also looking at galaxies. Here's an image of, of two interacting galaxies um, taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. It's a bit of a mess there because they're interacting. And then here, taken with the JWST. And you notice these brown areas uh, with Hubble, these are areas where there's lots of dust obscuring the starlight, right? But if you look in the infrared, suddenly you'll find that in these regions, stars are being formed at enormous rates, right? And we wouldn't know that until we looked in the infrared and then we saw these very bright emission from these regions, very compact, which is basically the light from all of these newborn stars. And this is from the, the goals program of which uh, one of our, our faculty, Professor Ann Medling, uh, was, uh, is, is working on. She's a member of that. So there's a little Toledo connection there. Now, some of you might have seen this um, press release, but here are some of the most distant galaxies right, that you can find in this picture. And you can see there are things that are tiny because they're distant and they're red. And the reason we know how far away they are is JWST has the ability to take the light and spread it out into a spectrum. Right? 
like a little rainbow of color, like you, you, if you had a prism and spread out the light into all the different constituent colors. And it turns out you can actually see emission from various atoms and ions and such that emit at very specific wavelengths. So for example, here's a spectrum of one of these objects, and you see some hydrogen, and you see some oxygen and such. And they emit at a very specific wavelength that you can measure in a lab here on Earth. But because of the expansion of the universe, they actually get stretched. And so the light gets stretched to longer wavelengths and longer wavelengths and longer wavelengths, right? And so the spectra look different, not because there's different material emitting, but because the light has been stretched out literally by the expansion of the universe. And the more stretched out it is, the further away it is. And there's a nice relationship with that. And so this galaxy, basically, the light has been traveling for 13.1 billion years, right? We're now catching light from galaxies that have formed a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. There's been a number of press releases, some of them a little bit exaggerating about this, and if you want to ask about it, I'll be happy to talk about those later. Right. Now, the other way we try to study things in astronomy is by, um, by theory, and often theory, we make computer simulations that approximate things. Right, because we, can't, we, can't, we, we want to understand a process that takes billions of years to unfold. So here is a computer simulation of the formation of a galaxy, right? Done on a supercomputer. These simulations literally take months on a supercomputer to do. So imagine what happens when your, your computer crashes after six months, right? And this is, this is what it would look like in visible light as a galaxy is being built up. Mostly light from stars, but if you look, there's some dust floating around. And occasionally, if you look carefully, it'll be a flicker of a supernova blasting everything around it, right? And, um, and, and you can also see stuff is falling in. It's a very chaotic process. Materials falling in, materials swirling around because of gravity, and, uh, and, and then there's basically what we call feedback, when the star is basically pushed back by undergoing supernova, or they have powerful winds, and they push the material back out again. Now, this is what it looked like to stars. If you're making a computer simulation, you can also see what the gas is doing. So this is what the gas is doing, all mostly hydrogen. It has different colors to correspond to different temperatures, but you can see there's a spiraling sort of um, web of gas that is forming stars and stuff piling in. It's, it's crazy, right? And this is, this, is, this is what our Milky Way probably went through over its billions of years of existence, right? And look at this neat little structure, which is partially due to all the sort of shearing of material as it rotates around, but also due to the feedback of stars. This one's relatively nearby. Uh, it's basically about, if I had the number right, about 60 million light years away. That's like our neighborhood for some. Um, and you can see all of this beautiful detail. And because it's an infrared telescope, not only do we see the stars, but we see the gas and dust clouds, primarily the dust in those clouds, glowing brilliantly, right? And this is work from an international team called FANGS, of which our Professors um, uh, Chandar and Smith are both members of. Right. These are also made, again, these pictures you can download. And this particular rendition was made by uh, Judy Schmidt, who's a, basically a citizen scientist who makes beautiful renditions of these images. Here's another one. I should also mention that we have a number of grad students, I haven't even listed them all, unfortunately, uh, who are involved in working on this, uh, this, this data of galaxies and such. Right. Um, so this is a, you know, there's, there's an intense effort of using this data here at, at University of Toledo. Now, one of the things you can notice is there's all these little holes here, which has probably been cleared out by stars, by stars, very massive stars, suddenly dying and undergoing supernova explosions um, and such, stars pushing back with their winds. The stars actually emanate very powerful winds and stuff. And you see all of these little bubbles here. And so you can see this percolation of all the gas and the dust, which is sort of regulating how quickly stars can form. Now, if you can, you can sort of zoom in, in a way, on one of these regions by looking at an example that's even closer. Right? So this thing is about 30 million light years away. Um, this thing is in a nearby galaxy. It's called a tarantula nebula, which is only 160,000 light years away. That means it takes 160,000 years for light to travel uh, from, from that object to our day. So that's, that's nothing within the life of the universe. right? Um, and I should say a, a light year is about a trillion miles. 
And here you can sort of see in detail that there's a whole cluster of stars, right, that have formed. I, I think there's like an, on the order of 10,000 stars or more that have formed, and they're all about a million years old, and they're clearing this big area of gas and dust. You can sort of see like a bubble of material there, and there's other stars sort of forming on the edges like this. And so this, again, is a James Webb Space Telescope image, and so it shows you how you can observe things from this scale on the scale of nearby galaxies down to the scales of clusters in the nearest galaxies. And then you can even look at even a closer region like this by scaling into a region in our own galaxy. This is a cloud of gas and dust on the edge of a massive cluster of stars in Carina. It's only 7,000 light years old. This is like nothing by our own galaxy standards. And so you can sort of see the gas and the dust glowing. Oh, but here, now we see a protostar. That's one single star being able to be being formed. And so now we've come from the scale with this one telescope where we can observe whole galaxies being formed literally a few hundred million years after the Big Bang to individual stars forming in our own galaxy. And we can put all of that information together to create a very comprehensive picture of how stars are formed and, and in general, how the universe evolves. Okay. Now, let me just give you, hopefully this will start, yep. This is a supercomputer simulation of the formation of a cluster of stars, starting with a cloud that's about a thousand times the mass of our sun, right? And so these, again, these, are, these actually simulate all the motions of, of the gas and the dust and stuff and how they collapse into stars. And it turns out you start with a cloud, and the cloud is very cold, like literally like 15 degrees above absolute zero. But it's also really stirred up in a complicated way, where parts, parts of the gas are colliding into each other at supersonic velocities, right? And that actually creates this weird, wispy structure, which you're seeing. And it looks just like wisps, but these are actually massive wisps of gas. They are basically hundreds, they can have contain hundreds of, the, of um, times the mass of the sun. And so what happens is, is gravity, these things start having their own gravity, and they start, their own gravity starts pulling these wisps together into these filamentary structures. And then in these filamentary structures, the gravity then pulls things together into little stars. And that's what you're seeing here, is now the gas is being pulled together to higher and higher and higher densities by gravity and starting to form stars. And once they start forming stars, then the crazy feedback occurs because the stars start shooting out jets, right? And so these little stars, once they form, they push back on their birth environment. And so you can see it's starting, starting to get really crazy now, right? And there's jets going everywhere. There's a whole star cluster. And as, as the star cluster forms, it's pushing back on this birth environment. It's actually literally destroying its own birth cloud and limiting the amount of stars that can actually form there. This process not only limits how many stars can form, but it also determines the masses of the stars ultimately. Right? And this is important because one of the fundamental things about star formation is it's a very inefficient process. If you start with 1,000 solar masses of gas, you might get 100 or 10 solar masses of stars, right? And then the, the, the gas may go into the next generation of stars later on. And those stars are very small, right? And so there's lots of inefficiencies. And one of the things that astronomers are trying to understand is that inefficiency. And that inefficiency has partly to do with the fact that when stars form, they push back on the surrounding environment through this process called feedback. And you can see there's massive stars going through some sort of supernova and all kinds of explosions going on. Right? It's a very chaotic process. This probably takes on the order of four or five million years right, to form a cluster. Now, this is a simulation. And when simulators, uh, when theorists do this, they, they can't simulate an entire cluster, every atom in a computer. And in fact, they make a lot of approximations to try to put the pieces together, which are their best guesses of how things work, like how does a star launch a jet. But the, as an observer like myself, we now need to test this picture, and we need to observe the formation of stars in more detail. And so this is where we go to the next thing of, of stars as a um, um, so telescopes as time machines. is basically looking at analogs of our own solar system. As it, so our own solar system formed 4.6 billion years ago, but we can find examples of stars forming right now in the local universe, right? 
And so we can actually learn how our star formed 4.6 billion years ago by looking at star formation now, and we can understand the process of star formation in general, right? Which hopefully I've convinced you is an essential process for basically shaping the entire trajectory of cosmic evolution. Right. So I want to get down to the part of the protostar. The protostar is really where the gas hits the star. Right? It's when, when the mass actually becomes, this gas that's left over from the Big Bang actually becomes part of the star. Here's the Hubble Space Telescope made um, at a wavelength that's about two and a half times that of red light. In a relatively close region in Orion that's only 1,300 light years away, literally our backyard for many astronomers. Now, if, here's a cartoon cutaway of what's probably going on here by, uh, by Robert Hurt. And so there's a cloud of gas and dust that is collapsing. But the center of it collapses first into a little star, right? So it's literally like a little star. It's in equilibrium. Most of its energy, though, it doesn't come from, from a fusion. It comes from the material landing on it. And it's called a protostar. That protostar is surrounded by a disk. And the reason you have a disk is that that cloud probably has a little bit of rotation to it, what, what physicists would call angular momentum. And as it collapses, just as a figure skater, as they pull into their arms and legs, they start spinning up more quickly, that material starts spinning up more quickly. And eventually, instead of landing on a star, it lands on a disk. And then through friction in that disk, eventually makes its way to the star, falls on the star, releasing lots of luminosity. But some of that material never makes it onto the star. It's launched in the jets. And these are the jets that we actually saw in the simulation before. Right? So this is the cartoon version. By the way, once the star formation process is over, the remnants of that disk make planets. Right? So planetary systems, like our own Earth, are basically the byproduct of the star formation process, which is another reason why, why astronomers are really interested in star formation. Okay, so here is one of the first James Webb Space Telescopes of a protostar. This one is, uh, they all have their own phone numbers. This is L1527, right? And they all, we all have many different phone books. It makes life really confusing in astronomy. This is an infrared image. The actual central protostar, you can't see. It's hidden by its own disk, which is seen edge on. But you can see this is amazingly beautiful structure here. Um, and if you could look, actually what we're seeing is sort of the hotter gas and dust. And so what's happening here is cold gas and dust, which James Webb is not good at seeing, but there are radio telescopes that can measure it, are coming in from this direction. They're all sort of landing on this disk and starting to form this protostar here. And then the jets are basically clearing out the gas here. And that's what we're seeing. So they're clearing cavities in the surrounding region. And so this is the process that we're trying to observe in more and more detail. How that gas gets down onto that disk, how it goes from the disk onto the star, and then how it is launched back. And then finally, how do all these processes work together to create a star like our sun, right? The mass of our sun. So let me show you some of the work that we've done uh, in Orion, right? So this is the Spitzer image of Orion. And Spitzer may have been small, but it was fast, right? And so it can map large areas of the sky very efficiently in the infrared. And so this is, this is part of Orion Nebula's down here. This is a huge area of the sky, almost from the, the top star of the sword down to the middle. And this is about four light years of space. And even in the infrared, at these wavelengths, you can see that there's a clouds of gas and dust that can even absorb infrared. But inside of them, protostars are, are forming. And those are those little greenish things that you can see in the center. Those are the protostars. And in fact, there's one massive protostar that's forming right there. It's about twice the mass of our sun, we know. And so you look in this region here. OK. Now, I'm going to blow it up. Now, I don't have the ability to make all of these beautiful press release images of our data. right? So it's not going to look as glorious as some of these, these you know, polished images that would come out of the Webb um, uh, Space Telescope Institute, where people they have people literally there to make these beautiful images. But let me just zoom in on this on an infrared wavelength. right? So that is this region here seen with Spitzer. This is about one light year of distance. And you can see one of these jets actually glowing as the material is being launched out of it, right? So the wavelength about seven times red. We also had this image, uh, this image, the same area with the Hubble Space Telescope as part of our, our program here at Toledo. And this is it. The protostar is sort of there, and you see something's going on, but it's hard to really say. 
So we got image with the James Webb Space Telescope. Now, James Webb is, is powerful, but it's very slow. And so this is the area that we mapped with James Webb. That doesn't seem very impressive, right? But let's blow it up a bit and see what's actually happening in the central region, right? So here, now we've blown it up, right? So here on the left, we have the Spitzer image. Now this is about, about 23 solar system diameters, right? So now we're getting on the sky scale of our own solar system. And Spitzer doesn't do so well. Each one of these is literally a pixel in the, the, um, the Spitzer camera seen in the infrared. There's two objects here, a protostar and another young star. If you go to Hubble, you have lots of resolution, but you don't go into the infrared, really, and so you can't really see the protostar very well. You do see this other star, and it looks broad. That's just an artifact. And then finally, to the right, there we see our object. The protostar is actually right there. It's still maybe hidden. We're trying to guess. We're trying to figure out exactly, not guess, but, but measure, exactly where the protostar is located right there. That's an artifact there. But we're now penetrating more deeply into this cloud of gas and dust down to the point of solar system scales. Now, this is impressive in itself, but James Webb has another sort of secret weapon here, is it can take any one of these pixels and make a spectrum of it, which Spitzer could not do. And so I can take the light from this central region and make a complete spectrum. And so this is what the spectrum looks like of that region, right? Now, you know, always in a public talk, people always, you know, uh, warn against showing spectra. So if you have any questions afterwards, I'd love to talk to you about. But basically, we take the light from the infrared and we basically unroll it, and we can see all the intensities of the light at different wavelengths, right? Just like the colors of the rainbow. And so this is what we see, right? Going from about three microns to five times red light down to about seven times, eight times red light, right? But what do you see here? Well, that is very hot hydrogen, right? That little peak there emitting at that particular wavelength, right? That is ionized iron. There's actually iron, and I'll show you where that iron is in a moment, right? Those things are hot molecular hydrogen. So hydrogen can come in two varieties. It can come as a single atom, or it can come as a molecule where two hydrogen atoms are bound together. That is from hot molecular hydrogen. And this stuff here is all these lines. It's actually a whole forest of lines. That's hot carbon monoxide, right? And not only can we uh, look at the spectrum at one point, but we can actually isolate the light at one wavelength and we can make an image of it. So here's the first image that I showed you, which I call the dusty haze. And that's the size of our solar system. It's basically about 200 AU out to the orbit of Eris. Right? So that's our solar system scale. So we're getting down to solar system scales. Right? I showed you the jet. Again, I don't have the, the, uh, the image capabilities to make these beautiful images like the uh, Space Telescope. But this is the jet of the material. By the way, this, this has never been shown to the public before. Right? So don't tell anyone outside this room. Once you, once you, once you leave those doors, it's all got be hushed. If there's any reporters here, no, this is embargoed. Um, anyway, uh, uh, which I hope not, but um, this is the jet that's being launched, and we actually see it in carbon monoxide. And then in glowing molecular hydrogen, well, we are not really sure what's happening there because it's all kinds of weird shapes, right? So we, we've had this data reduced for a few months now, and we are still sort of trying to understand it. Um, uh, well, first you had to reduce the data. It doesn't just come in a nice little package data. You have to actually anal you have to figure out how to calibrate the data. You have to figure out how to analyze it. And then once you analyze it, you have to figure out how to use this rich set of information to understand what's going on. And so we're still working on it. This, by the way, is a grad student at Rochester, Adam Rubenstein, spent a long time trying to create a color image of this. And it's, it's actually quite difficult. But this is this nice little color image showing these, these things in combination, right? Let me show you one last protostar, and I'll end with this. Uh, they all have their phone numbers. This one's IRAS 16253. This is the Spitzer infrared view, and the protostar is right there. You can see, hopefully by now, you've, you've learned to identify outflow cavities. Boom, there's JWST. Only a small portion is mapped, but with exquisite angular resolution, right? We can now see in detail this protostar, right, glowing. And this is the, what I call the dust 
this is the spectrum of it, right? It goes all the way from about three microns to about 30 microns, and there is a lot of stuff going on. We spend a lot of our time just trying to identify what all of these different little spikes are, but you can see there's, there's hot glowing molecular hydrogen. I can't even find my, my cursor now. There's, there's iron, there's neon, there's nickel. Uh, there's literally a whole periodic table of just crazy activity going on. And each one of these gives a different picture, right? So for example, those jets, well, here's one of those jets of gas moving 100 kilometers per second, right? Seen in ionized iron, right? And these, these, and then on top of that, we see all this glowing molecular hydrogen surrounding that jet. And so we're trying to figure out exactly how this jet is interacting with the surrounding medium. But what we're seeing is this protostar literally ripping apart its birth cloud using all of these different tracers. And so this is, this is you know, we're just starting down this path, but um, it's going to be a really interesting one when we put all this data together. Right, and we have five protostars uh, in, this, in our sample. This program, by the way, I should mention, is a program led by, um, I think I had it up as a slide before, and I, I got so into the science, I forgot the, uh, the background, so let me just unfurl this. This is actually a program called Investigating Protostellar Accretion, um, and it is an international consortium of Europeans, Asians, uh, and South and North America, basically. So institutions in Taiwan, Japan, all across Europe, um, in, in Chile and in the U.S. And what that means is it's impossible to schedule telecons, really. Uh, it is a problem. But it's led here by myself at UToledo, right? And I should also say that these images here are from one of our grad students, the Spectre, uh, Sam Fetterman, who's been doing, is doing his thesis work on this particular data. Right. And so here's another one of our objects. This is actually being worked on by an Indian astronomer who's now in Taiwan. So you can just see our team is even moving locations as they work. Um, and one of the cool things about this, and we're now doing collaborations with groups in the Netherlands on this, is um, that all these little sort of wiggles here are actually ices, right? So I told you that there's dust in these clouds. This dust is very cold. And so molecules like water, of water, of methanol, of carbon dioxide condense onto the, the surfaces, onto the, onto the grains, right? They create little icy mantles. And these are important because what we think now is that the water that is in our bodies that we're drinking was actually transported into our own solar system on these dust grains, right? And so we're watching, oh, this is, we're watching right here, material falling onto the central disk containing water and organic molecules, which can later go into forming planets, right? So this is sort of setting the inventory material that will be available. And that's, this is something that's, again, an ongoing area of investigation. But you can just see how rich this data set is and, and how perplexing it is to actually analyze it. All right, let me just give you one uh, brief um, uh, example of something we're doing that's not exactly star formation, but is investigating something that's between stars and planets. These are objects called brown dwarfs, and uh, Professor Mike Cushing here is an expert at this. And this is just sort of gives you sort of like a zoo of kinds of objects that we find uh, in, in, our, in our galaxy. Here's our sun. This is a red star. I told you most stars are like red, cool objects like this one. Um, here's Jupiter. Right? Right, our own friendly Jupiter in our solar system. And between that, there are actually objects that are sort of in between stars and planets. They're not orbiting individual stars, but they're roughly the size and temperatures of planets down, down to literally like room temperature. And we are studying to sort of understand, well, both to understand the atmospheres of planet-like objects and to understand all these objects that sort of, you know, are found between stars and planets. Uh, a group here at Toledo is taking spectra of these. And so this is actually spectrum that, that a grad student, Sam Byler, gave me. I'm not going to go into details, but you can see there's all these strong features here, and they're all due to molecules, like methane, water, carbon monoxide. And that, again, shows you the power of spectroscopy, of JWST, of the infrared, because now we can look at a distant object light years away, and we can unravel its composition, right? Whether it's ionized iron or water and such. Okay, 
So um, in conclusion, I hope I showed you uh, that, uh, well, the power of the James Webb Space Telescope, right? And also the power of, the, of using infrared observations, which we have a lot of expertise here at Toledo. Um, I also um, hope I sort of showed you that there's this connection, both initially because it was somebody from Toledo who suggested this whole idea of putting uh, telescopes in space, and now there's a small fleet of telescopes in space spanning the electromagnetic spectrum. And living in this legacy now, we have astronomers, professors, grad students, uh, even undergraduates who are working with this data from space telescopes, you know, trying to basically explore the universe, understand star formation, understand planet formation with this data. Right? So it's, it's an incredible opportunity for us here in Toledo to do. If you are um, interested in more astro, if this talk wasn't enough for you, um, there is stuff coming up. Right? There is basically the reopening of the Ritter Planetarium with the new Digistar 7. I feel like I have to say that with reverb. Digistar 7, right? Uh, which is a fantastic new projector. And I think the uh, reopening is March 31st. And go to the website, uh, which is simply ritter.utoledo.edu, to find out information. And also on April 27th, how many people have ever actually seen that image, by the way? It's one of the most viewed science images. It's actually an image of a black hole in a distant galaxy made with the highest angular resolution telescope ever made, literally by, by, by putting together telescopes, a network of telescopes that span the entire Earth. And on April 27th, the founding director of that telescope, the Event Horizon Telescope, is going to give a, a, a talk, a public talk at 7 p.m. It's on a Thursday evening here at Toledo. And so look for the, uh, that. We'll, there'll be more advertising about that in the near future. And then finally, I left some links up here. These are not complete. You can find many things. But things that I like to go to when I want to look up information on web or infrared astronomy. There's some actually great infrared astronomy musicals in that one, if you're into musicals and such. And then there's APOD which always shows fantastic images. And so thank you for your attention. I'm here to uh, answer any questions. Love to get them. And we can also, uh, a little bit later after the questions, if people want to take a look at themselves in the infrared, uh, please feel free. Thank you. Which, which slide? <laughs> the very first slide. Oh my gosh. All right. Well, we'll have to like go through and use warp speed to do that. <laughs> yep. This one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you said it, <laughs> one of the uh, one of the images of James Webb that there's on-screen artifacts. How do you determine like what is an actual like anomaly and what is something that you Oh, what is it? Well, um, yeah, uh, sometimes it's, it's really obvious. Um, <laughs> you guys really getting into the, like, the, the nitty gritty of what we spend our days doing. Um, yeah, well, you know, some of the stuff is easy. Like, if you see like a black spot in the middle of a star, that's basically where a pixel has been saturated. We see this like little cross through that. That, that can't be an astronomical thing. There are some times where when you show a spectrum and you see a line, there's sometimes cases where is that line real or is there some sort of artifact there? And then sometimes we have to do different tricks like look at it in different positions and stuff. Um, what, one of the, one of the um, forms of artifact that's really hard to get rid of are cosmic rays. So this telescope is sitting in space and it's constantly being barred by cosmic rays. And when those cosmic rays hit the detector, they leave little, little bits of a uh, little, in, uh, well, they, they leave electrical charge, which makes it appear like a signal. So sometimes you don't know if it's a cosmic ray or a star. The reason, the reason you get rid of those is you take multiple images right after each other, and the cosmic ray only hits one. But that is a real problem. There's, there's lots of, I mean, I would never volunteer for a go to Mars, because you would not believe how many cosmic rays are going to go through your brain on your way there. <laughs> right. But you can see them all in our detectors. Yeah, during a solar storm. Have you ever seen a detector during a solar storm? Whoa, it's it's insane. But but fortunately, the detectors recover after these. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Could you go more in depth on protostars? On protostars. Oh, okay. Well, you you found my favorite topic, but um, um, I don't know if you had specific questions. Um, I mean, uh, is, is there anything specifically that you wanted to know about a protostar? Nothing. I was just wondering if you could like. 
Uh, I don't have a lot of notes on it, and I have to write it. Oh. Uh, uh, well, how about we, we look for a, well, uh, why don't you come up afterwards briefly, and I'll give you, I'll give you like a little tutorial, and if there's any other questions, <laughs> which is fine. I, I'm always, uh, I'm happy to help. <laughs> Thank you for an excellent summary. You use many biological terms to talk about the birth of the universe, the evolution, the death. There are random variations in the stars and planets. Presumably, Darwinian evolution films take care of this. The fittest ones will survive. I thought it interesting at the very end, you ended up with the fittest of all, the black hole. Is that the one that's going to swallow it all? I, I think the difference between like the evolution of the universe. I mean, we, yeah, we do use the same terms, uh, and astronomers are always bad at terminology, right? And you're, but but the difference between like by 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 Darwinian evolution and sort of the birth and death cycles there is in Darwinian information, what's basically being transferred is information, right? So you can actually have natural selection. You can't have natural selections of stars because there's no way that they don't give birth to something that that replicates that same information that you get with the DNA, and so stars can produce material, and that's how they, they affect the next generation of stars, but they don't trans inf transmit information about how they're made or their, their characteristics. So you can't, there's an analogy, but it's not a perfect one, because that's what makes life different. You have the molecules that can carry information. Okay. Sure. <laughs> um, so I know that brown wolves are just being a star in the but like, so why do they call them brown wolves? Oh, that is like, uh, because astronomers, basically somebody made up the name one time. Uh, I think it was Jill Tarter had made up the name. And they just wanted to find something that had a sort of in the intermediate color. As I said, the, the real answer is astronomers are really bad at terminology. And then a the term gets used, and it just gets, like there were red dwarfs, which are small stars. And so brown was supposed to be like a little bit colder than that. But you know, it's, it's yeah, it, it's not a very descriptive term. What they are is they're, they're, they're stars that are less than 0 0.08 times the mass of our sun, and they don't have enough mass for nuclear fusion to occur. So our sun, after its protostellar phase, it actually, it actually shrank in luminosity and size until nuclear fusion started in its center. And at that point, you have an equilibrium that can last 9 billion years, and that actually gave our planet the ability uh, for life to evolve and stuff like that. Right. But around the brown dwarf, it doesn't have that power, so it just gets cooler and cooler and cooler and cooler with time until you have objects like the one I showed you, which is only a few hundred degrees, of, you know, basically room temperature, because it doesn't have that, that source of energy. Yeah. And there's, there's like everything in here I can make a lecture on, <laughs> sadly. Yeah. Because of the shape of the yeah, well, that's a, that's a good question. So it, it creates, um, there's, a, there's a process called diffraction, which is the way when light waves hit like a, like a mirror or some object, the light bends or diffracts. And it creates these spiky patterns. So the reason you can actually see the impact, so all of these stars, they're points. They're not, we actually don't make a map of the star. It's just literally a point of light. But because of the process of diffraction, um, it basically, the telescope spreads the light out. And it does it in a way that creates this hexagonal pattern with these, these spikes coming out. And it's actually a bit of a problem because say you want to find a planet, right? And so you make this really super sensitive image of a planet, of a star, it's really bright, you want to find a planet, and it turns out the planet is sitting right on one of those little spikes. You'd never find it. Right? So astronomers have spent a lot of effort trying to figure out how to minimize this amount of scattered light and stuff so that they can find planets. And so the next generation of space telescopes will probably have techniques that will be used to sort of get rid of that glow. So. You have an infrared telescope that I can't see, and yet you're showing me a picture of a blue light. Yeah. Well, okay. So when I sh yeah, this is light you can't see, so it's it's transferred into colors that you can see. So you have an algorithm that converts this spectrum to blue. 
yeah. So what you do is, yeah, the algorithm is called Photoshop. <laughs> but not Photoshop in a negative. We're not trying to create deep fakes of the universe or anything like that. It's just that you know you can create like you can create a color image like having a blue image, a green image, and a red image. Except when we create an image of uh, from the James Webb, basically we use three different filters. And one filter, we say the, the shortest wavelength of light, the most bluish one, we get the blue color. The middle one, we get the green color. And the longest wavelength, we get the red. And so when you see an image like this, there's actually multiple images. They take an image, and then they, they, they change filters. And then they take an image, and they take another filter, and these filters again. They take another image, and they change filters again. It's a very long and laborious process. And then they beam this data down, and then someone combines all of this data artistically. And believe me, I've tried. It's really hard to do images that look this nice. Um, um, to create this. But they're not trying to hide anything. They're just trying to highlight different structures and stuff like that. So they're not creating data. They're just rendering it in a way that our brains can sort of comprehend that. Uh, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So. Uh, similar to his question, you get this data from NASA and these images from NASA. What types of software are you using to process it and analyze it? Oh, well, everyone like, there, there's different software packages that you can use. Uh, a lot of what we do is actually in Python, if you want to know. We to repeat. There's Python scripts that are now being shared by, it's trying to find someone who has the right script to, observe, to reduce your data. But there's actually different packages. None of them, so the Space Telescope is never, they, they provide calibrated data and some calibrated, well, mostly calibrated data It has some issues. They provide raw data, they provide some calibration material, and then it's up to the astronomer using whatever software that they um, that they prefer to actually combine this data and analyze it, right? And there's generational differences. Like I use one bit of software, but all my grad students use another type of software. So <laughs> I'm feeling very outdated these days, but uh, that's the way it works. Yeah. Any other? Oh. Can you tell us oh, what sorry. comes after James Webb Space Telescope? Since it's already in space, I'm sure there's a new generation of telescopes probably being developed right now. Like, which direction are they going? OK, yeah, that's, that's actually an extra, excellent question. Um, yeah, so James Webb, by the way, has the potential to last about 20 years, which is much longer than people have thought. Um, I mean, it's a complex device, and so things can go wrong. But theoretically, it could last 20 years, given the amount of, uh, they, they need a little bit of, of gas for jets to keep it stabilized, right? So the next big, uh, what we call great observatory that NASA is going to be launched. So NASA launches, and the European Space Agency's a bunch, a bunch of smaller telescopes, and then a few big ones, right? So the big ones are on billion dollar budgets. The smaller ones are a few hundred million, right? And uh, the next big one is called the Roman Space Telescope. And what it can do is map, it's basically the same wavelengths as Hubble, but it has a huge field of view. And so it can map very large areas of the sky very quickly. And it's going to be looking for things that change. Well, one of its things is looking for things that change in time. So it's the time domain. And, and look for uh, all kinds of things, things called gravitational lensing, uh, variability in stars, all kinds of different uh, things. And that one, oh, I don't remember what the current launch date. So Roman is being built right now. I think the launch date is, I don't know, does anyone, it's like 20. 30 something Karen is sort of like nodding there yeah yeah so it's like in the 20 mid 2030s and then after that it's not clear also the Europeans will probably put up an x-ray satellite in the next decade uh, but then the, the next generation after that we're still putting together the plans for that right now so yeah but planets a lot of it will probably be focused on finding planets that seems to be a big driver for NASA at the moment yeah. any other questions well, you're also welcome to, to come down and, and take a look at yourself in the infrared um, and, uh, or see yourself through the plexiglass. And I'm also happy to answer any other questions that you may not have wanted to ask out here. So. Thank you.